Hi there. So this is a quick recap on Unit Two, just to make sure that we've 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 you know concluded and and, and wrapped up on each uh, on each of the questions. So one of the questions you had in the thread was, what is research? What is it not? Um, I think the danger that you've seen in terms of definitions is that uh, we have to be careful that we are not um, specific to a point where we exclude some of the methodologies out there. Um, so there is a specific danger that often we try and define uh, research from a quantitative or positivist sort of lens and start talking about hypothesis, start talking about validity, but something which is not relevant for other other forms of, of research, which may be phenomenological, for example, and may work from qualitative uh, sort of approaches. So I record these things at night every time and I, I, I should do it in the day because the, the exhaustion starts to hit. Um, so, uh, in your efforts, you will probably have seen that we keep coming back to this notion of scientific process, which seeks to um, explore phenomena with rigor. And really, there will be more sophisticated definitions, but really, these are key elements that you are, you are looking at. Um, try and avoid always to start looking about truth, and uh, because again, truth leads you to this. Um, notion that needs to be unpacked, are you talking about a positivist sort of uh, in your lens on truth, are you looking at a phenomenological lens on truth? And so we've got to remain both specific but also wide enough that we can incorporate all of the different forms of, of research and methodologies that we encounter. So again, uh, a scientific process that seeks to explore phenomena with rigor and, and uh, lead to obviously um, you know, findings and, and, uh, and outcomes. Um, the next question which you had was, is education will be different than uh, research in other fields? So it, it is to some extent, and we've discussed this already, you have many stakeholders in educational research, parents, communities, students, teachers, um, st students and, uh, and leaders, and of even policymakers and governmental um, employees. So it's a field where you are going to have a multitude of, of uh, of perspectives, which makes it a little harder. Not to say that there's no other field when it's the case, but there's a lot of field where we don't have as many stakeholders. Um, the second uh, element is that obviously we are in the public sector. This is part of public sec of public sector service, uh, and therefore one of the um, outcomes of research, um, which you, you know, there's some common ones that you encounter in every field um, to better understand the world, etc. Uh, but for us in education, it has a specific aim as well, in part, sometimes, to um, change policy, government policy, and enlighten and inform government policy. Um, so it's not just um, purely abstract. Um, it does have that, um, that, 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 uh, that sort of objective as well, that it, it's there to eventually change policy and change the way we do things in the field itself. What are the essential stages of educational research? So this is where we see a disconnect between the way an article would be written, I've given you those steps already, and um, the stages of research, particularly at the beginning, and this is where it can get really confusing for graduate students. So um, you in a, in a, I'll repeat this, the stages again that appear in the general articles. You would have an intro and context, it had different names, but basically that's what this, it, it does. Um, then a section on literature review, a section on theory, a section on methodology, a section on um, data so on findings, and then a data on a section on outcomes and, and discussion. When you look at sorry, when you look at uh, the process itself in the field, it's a little more complex than that, and that's why it becomes um, complex for graduate students. Because intro and context, well, you can't actually write that before you've actually got the gap, and you can't get the gap before you've done the literature review. So, in fact. As graduate students and as young researchers, you are likely to actually browse the literature for a, quite a while, find the gap, see what um, questions remains available and, and pertinent within the gap of, in the literature that you've, uh, you've um, identified. By the gap, we mean that uh, you know, a lot of things have been researched already, so you're looking for something that hasn't been researched. And then that's why you find your question, and then you go back to the research design, and then you structure it in the way that we've seen in journal articles. So there is a hypocrisy and an ambivalence there that when we format things and we present them to you, that's not actually how it happens in, in practice. Well, it does happen like that for people who are very experienced. So um, 
you know, I, I think uh, when you're a, a more senior researcher, you are able to function exactly as it is described in a journal article because you have in your head a fairly good understanding of what is done by your colleagues and what's done around the world. The literature review, you haven't done it in detail, but you have some key elements in your head. So you know where the gap is and you know what kind of questions you'd be attracted to. So if someone who's more senior in research uh, tackles a problem, they would actually think, oh, we've got an idea, there's something here no one's doing. So I'm going to explain the, the context and intro, set the design question, or design of the question, and then I'm going to go to the literature review to um, show that there's indeed a gap, and then you go forward. So that's a, the journal article formatting is a very suitable in terms of process when you're talking about someone who has a lot of expertise in the field. But you don't have that. You don't go to conferences. You're not aware of what other people are doing. You don't have that sort of you know, international perspective on what's being done. So for young graduate students, actually, the process is very different. As I said, you actually start by the literature review. You find the gap. You try and find your question and design your question. And then you flip it back and you introduce your question and then go back to the literature review. Okay. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a definitely a, a contradiction and an ambivalence there, depending on um, the level of expertise and the level of knowledge you have in the field. Um, some of the, then you asked to look at some of the challenging. So, um, you know, identifying the gap in the literature. Well, we will see this in coming in the coming unit that identifying the gap in the literature is actually quite difficult. So the challenge there is that you may miss out completely on certain elements of the literature review. And if you do that, then you don't, then you have the wrong gap or you, you state that something is a gap when it's not a gap because someone else might have researched it. So again, it presumes that you are fairly experienced at finding the gap. So the literature review is a tough exercise. And for young researchers, there's always a danger there that if you do, do it badly, then the whole foundation for your study is, is, is wrong, basically. Now, don't panic. In this exercise, I'm not going to penalize you if you miss out something and you state something to be a gap and it's not a gap. You're learning. You're still in the process of learning. But as you try this in real life, as you try your first research paper, you can sometimes get it very wrong. And that's the big hurdle. Um, and uh, another contradiction or sort of ambivalence about the process is that it's very hard to write a literature review when you don't know what the literature is. So you will see this in as a tension in the exercise when you do it yourself, because it's both, it's an outward exploration without really parameters because you don't know what you're looking for. And then it's about bringing it back in a cohesive way. Um, so when you're very comfortable with that literature, that's easy because you know there's certain things and you go there and then you may have a few papers that you've missed. So you're going to find those and then you bring it together, but it's still a very creative process. For young researchers, when you don't know what's out there, you're sort of heading, you're fishing in the dark, right? You're shooting in the dark. You're, you're trying all sorts of things and you're hoping that you catch it all and then you're able to bring it back in a cohesive way. So there's, there's definitely a, a bit of tension there. Uh, another group, another thread was looking at determining the problem and considering the implication. Um, that's really the, the design question, basically, right? So it's that intro and context. Um, it's an easier section, but sometimes um, it is, sometimes it's badly done because um, you may not be able to contextualize it as effectively as you should. Um, but I would say it's probably... It's probably the easiest. Um, some of the errors that I see graduate students do, particularly in this course, is that when you're contextualizing, you can be too broad, too wide. Um, you know, you're designing a question for someone in mind. So you expect a certain group of stakeholders to want to read your study, maybe more than one. But, you know, is it for teachers? Is it for parents? Is it for students? Uh, and then you are also expecting to, to be inquiring that, uh, you know, investigating that phenomenon, inquiring about that phenomenon with the specific group of stakeholders. Are you um, talking about this phenomenon with leaders? Are you talking about it with parents? Are you talking about students? And it's a very different research question depending on who you talk to. So at times I find that in setting the problem, considering the implications, students can be too broad, too vague. They are too ambitious. They want to talk to everyone. You're not going to talk to everyone. You're going to have to actually select a group of stakeholders. Um, and then, um, or, yeah, so it, 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 it's, it can be too, too broad or too vague. Uh, that's the, the major issue. Uh, another thread uh, was looking at the research proposal itself. So it's a long document. It's got a very specific structure. Um, it has a very specific tone um, and a specific proportion, right? So the literature review can't be too long because you basically your entire 
proposal is the paper as written up to findings and outcomes. That won't change. It's literally there. You will change the, the, the tenses because normally in the proposal you'll say, I will, you know, the research will do that. The research will be about that. And then when you actually publish the paper, you change all these futures to the past. I did that. This is what happened, etc. cetera. Um, but the, the structure remains pretty much for the first sections entirely um, as it is. And then you just add the findings and the outcomes. So a whole paper should take 5,000, should be 5,000 words. That's usually the goal to be publishable. Um, so you've got to look at your proportions, right? So the literature should really not be more than a thousand words because out of, you know, 5,000 word paper, you want to keep a good 2,000 for the findings and, and the outcomes. Um, so there are some very specific proportion proportion rules there um, that you have to look at. And that's that's the difficulty for, for young researchers is... Is not getting too carried away that suddenly your literature review is 2,000 words and your whole paper is you know, in no longer holds together. So it's this sort of thing we're looking at. Uh, another thread was looking at collection and analyze, an analysis of data. Lots of problems here. Uh, lots of possible hurdles. Um, lots of young qualitative researchers uh, will get overwhelmed by the amount of data because, again, they're being too ambitious or they've got really efficient methods, but they suddenly have much more data than they ever thought they would have. Um, and then the analysis is, 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 is light on the detail, or sometimes it's just not done. It's sort of a work in progress and things get through another page. So the data is presented, but it's not analyzed. And that's really troublesome when you see work done, work like that. And then identifying and reporting findings. Um, that can be problematic too, because um, we will see that, for example, if your theory isn't present, it may be very difficult to um, make sense of data, of data, even if findings are, are, are you know, are interesting, the theory is going to give you the scope within which to interpret what's relevant about these findings. Um, so something that we find is that this is again, not a course on theory, but um, in the drawing of the proposal, sometimes people are light on theory or sometimes people just forget about theory altogether. And then when you get to the paper in the, in the findings and making sense of the finding, it lacks context, it lacks scope because there is no theoretical lens, right? You've, all you have in the end is the analysis data. I found this, but I found this doesn't mean much if you don't have a context within which you, you can analyze why um, what you found is relevant. And that's where the theory comes in. So that's one of the challenges when it comes to the reporting and analysis. It also takes, um, what we haven't mentioned, it takes a, a writing skills um, particularly if you're working qualitative data, it's not about numbers, so you need to interpret your data and showcase it to your to your uh, reader and make sense of um, you know come come forward with an analysis that is cohesive and makes sense to your reader, and that can be really difficult if you don't write well. So there's a whole um, implicit um, sort of task, which is or, or you know objective, which is to write well to write concisively in an accessible format with lay person terms uh, and to make your findings really easy to understand to the people that read it. And that's an art that you will develop, but it can be problematic. It certainly is a hurdle for, for a lot of researchers. So I think we come to the end. Let me just check the PowerPoint, see if there was anything else. Oh, and the variables. So the variables I've talked um, previously about time resources so resources so do you have funding do you not have funding available that's really going to change the format of what you what you have in terms of, of ambitions with the funding comes team so you will have research assistants so we won't have research assistants so obviously if you have a research assistant you might try things that are more ambitious you may also try tools that are much more time consuming something simple like transcription and now recording is four hours of transcription work so it's going to be very heavy on yourself as a, as a researcher, but suddenly if you have a, you know, a research assistant, you might then tackle above six participants because then it doesn't matter the number of hours um, that are spent doing that because you've got, um, you know, you've got someone to help you. Um, but don't forget that, as I've said, people are normally hired in departments where there's a strong flavor. So sometimes you, get, you lean towards certain forms of research design simply because you work in an environment where it's expected that everyone works within certain themes or certain methods, etc. Um, you are also sometimes working in a career. So you're not as free as you imagine. Sometimes, you know, we have this picture of the researcher being completely autonomous, independent. You're in a career, you have, you have to show a career path, you have to show a portfolio as, 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 a, as a, you know, a researcher. And that might be um, key in making certain decisions, you may choose 
perhaps smaller pro pro projects because you're very keen that by the time you get to your you know, your tenure application, those articles are finished and written and you're able to evidence them. So that time frame, that career time frame becomes very important. Sometimes it could be interesting to do uh, you know longitudinal studies or or something um, larger, but if it's not something you can translate into a publication within next year, it may affect your career path. It may be something that you know it's that it, that's a luxury that you would do if you could. But in the in your career uh, sort of uh, format, you need some faster evidence of of you know outcomes of research. So as you see, there's a lot of and we've mentioned a few in the in the collaborate session. There's a lot of factors, which means that this this. Uh, this notion of, oh, I'm going to design a question that I like in a format that I like with the freedom that I want, with the methodology that I want, is not really a good picture of, of the reality of what research is like. In fact, in practice, um, you are much more to, likely to be guided by such a set of factors that when you come to it, it's pretty determined that you're going to work on this sort of time frame with this amount of money, probably with this methodology, looking at something that's linked to your existing portfolio. So it's not as creative as not free, as it's not autonomous as, as we as we often pretend. And that's very important in this course. It's really important that you see research as being a pragmatic process, not as simply a conceptual um, thing that you would do in a void. No one does research in a void. You do it in context. And it's very important that you understand that context. So that wraps up unit two. And I'll do the same when we get to the end of unit three, so that each time you have a, a quick summary just to recap the discussions that you've had on the on the forum.